the fourth chapter of Revelation, we discover one of the two main reasons that we worship God. In Revelation chapter 4, John was in vision, in the Spirit. In verse 2, he says, There before me was a throne in heaven. And someone was sitting on the throne. He described him and went on to say, In the center around the throne were four living creatures. And verse 9, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sat on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship him. Now, why do they worship the one sitting on the throne? Listen. They say, verse 11, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power because you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. We worship God because he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And all of the beings in heaven adore and praise and honor God because they know He is their Creator. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, all of the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast except for those whose names are written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb. In the heavenly circles, all living beings worship the Creator, but on the earth they worship the beast who is the creature. And I want to tell you that that is the focal point. That is the issue of the book of Revelation. Read through the book of Revelation and over and over again this word appears, the word worship. We worship the Creator and the issue in Revelation is the worship of the Creator God or the worship of the creature. The beast is the creature. And practically the whole world worships the creature. In the mid-1800s, modern science joined hands with God's church in filtrating the ranks of God's people with a new philosophy that would undermine God's authority as the creator of the heavens and the earth. In the mid-1800s, Charles Darwin published his book, The Origin of Species, popularizing the theory of evolution and since that time neither the world nor the church have been the same. Satan knew that if he was ever to receive the allegiance of those who want to be the people of God he must somehow obscure the significance, the authority of God as the Creator. But God wasn't caught by surprise. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, I saw another angel flying in the midair. He had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people, every living being on this earth. And he said in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has come. We are close to the very end. This is God's special message crafted for the end times. And listen to what it says. Worship Him. Worship who? Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and all that is in them. Worship the creator of the heavens and the earth. At the same time that Satan is trying to turn the attention of the world away from the creator towards man, towards himself, 
God has a message. Worship the Creator of the heavens, the earth, the seas, and all that is in them. You see, the last book in the Bible points us all the way back to the first verse in the Bible. Look at it with me. Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis, the first chapter, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible tells us clearly God created the heavens and the earth. And there was darkness over the face of the earth. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Now you need to understand something that if you could read this in Hebrew, the Hebrew words are a rev boker. There was a rev boker, evening, morning, the first day. A rev evening, the dark part of the day. Boker, morning, the light part of the day. There was the dark part, there was the light part one day. There is no way that God could have said it any clearer that he's talking about the same kind of day that we have today, a literal 24-hour day. And then the Bible says on the second day God made the sky and there was a rev boker, evening, morning, the second day. And then on the third day God caused the dry ground to appear and the trees and the plants, the vegetation, the flowers. And there was evening and there was morning, the third day. Tell me something. If there had been a team of scientists present on that day and they saw this tree that God had just made and they walk up to the tree and drill into it extracting a core counting the rings how old do you think the scientists would say the tree was you see science can't always account for the things of God I'm not putting down science, but I'm lifting up God. And then God created the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. God created the universe on the fourth day, one evening, one morning. And then God filled the waters with the fish, and he filled the air with the birds. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. How long did it take for God to make a bird? One evening, one morning, the fifth day. And then on the sixth day, God made the wild animals according to their kind. I don't see room here for any kind of interpretation that allows for millions of years of time to pass with the survival of the fittest and the struggle to survive with animals living and dying and living and dying and killing and struggling to survive. I don't see anything like that. I don't see randomness in this chapter. I see order. I see a God of power who orderly brought things into existence, not by chance but by design. And then on the sixth day, in verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image. Chapter 2, verse 7, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living soul. You know, there's something that escapes us if we don't know a little Hebrew. You see, in Genesis chapter 1, the word used for God is Elohim, a word that is filled with an expression of the power of God. 
But when we get to Genesis 2, where it describes God forming the man, he didn't just say, tree, and there's a tree, sun, and there's a sun, giraffe, and there's a giraffe, hippo, and there's a hippo. He didn't do it that way. It says the Lord God formed the man. He knelt down and with his own hands tenderly, lovingly shaped his body from the dust of the ground, bent over and gave it the kiss of life. And it became a living being. What a picture of God. And what you miss in the English, it uses a different word for the name of God. It uses the Hebrew word that we think is pronounced Yahweh, the covenant God, the loving God, the God who would come and die on the cross to save the creatures he had just made. What a God. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work He had been doing. So on the seventh day, He rested. He put an exclamation point beside the word finished. He rested. God was done creating after the seventh day. That does not leave room for millions and millions and millions of years of evolution that's just supposed to be still going on today. He was finished after the sixth day. I believe the Bible account of creation. I believe that God made this world in six literal 24-hour days and on the seventh day God finished His work. I believe that. And I believe that it's essential to believe that if you're ever going to understand the book of Revelation, the last book. Because God is going to recreate this world again. Just like He intended for it to be at the beginning. Bible writers all believed it. And they all talked about it. One of my favorite places is in Psalm, the 33rd chapter, verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, the starry host by the breath of His mouth. He spoke, verse 9, and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. What power! I remember years ago when... The, what, the last Star Wars movie came out. Some of you, you remember that? They showed a news clip on television, people lining up block after block around the block waiting to get in to see Star, see Star Wars so they could see the force. <laughs> this is the force. A God whose very word has the power to make that word happen. If he wants a tree, he says the word tree. And in the word is the power for the tree to appear. Now that's force. He wants a universe, he says universe, and it's there. Star Wars has nothing on our God. I believe the Bible account. I believe it's essential in order to understand Revelation but I want to tell you, it's not popular today. In fact, your children are being taught something entirely different in the public school systems. Your children are being taught that life as we know it today is not the result of an intelligent, loving God, but it's a result of accident, chance, survival of the fittest, living and dying and killing and living and dying and killing. You've heard of the Big Bang Theory. Well, I, I believe in the Big Bang Theory. God said it and bang, it happened. <laughs> they don't teach it that way in the schools. They just say, it happened. Well, what happened? 
What was the bang? What was there before the bang? What made it bang? You see, they can't teach them that. But we know. And the tragedy is that in teaching the theory of evolution as though it were a scientific fact and as though anyone else who believed, anyone who believed something different was ignorant, is setting your children up to worship the creature instead of the creator and to take the mark of the creature which is the mark of the beast. That's why, folks, we're going to take some time to divert our attention a little bit. In the world today, the issues that are threatening your children and even you to divert your attention away from God's authority as the creator of the heavens and the earth. We're going to take a little time. Because anyone who tends to believe anything other than the theory of evolution is considered an ignorant, a moron. In fact, Richard Dawkins wrote, he's a famous atheistic evolutionist, he said, if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane. And then he added, or wicked, but I'd rather not consider that. Why not? Because he can't. Because I'm going to show you, if you believe in evolution, there's no such thing as wicked. But that comes a little later. Maybe you'd never heard of Dr. Philip Johnson of California, Berkeley, who assembled a team of famous scientists in June of 1993 at Pajaro Dunes, California. These scientists, men like Jonathan Wells, William Dembski, Michael Behe, who wrote Darwin's Black Box and stood the scientific world upside down with his irreducibly complex system. He discovered that life consists of systems that are so complex, if you break them down to their basic pieces, if you take away any one of those pieces, it would cease to function. Therefore, it was impossible to be the result of a gradual process of evolution. And it's still no good answer for irreducible complexity today. They think they have, but they haven't. Maybe you'd never heard of these men who were all dissatisfied with Darwin's approach to evolution and left the Pajaro Dunes conference in agreement that life as we know it today must be the result of an intelligent designer. That's exactly what Michael Behe said. He concluded in his book, Darwin's Black Box, life on earth at its most fundamental level, its most critical component, is the product of intelligent activity. The conclusion of intelligent design flows naturally from the scientific data itself and not from the sacred books. We didn't get it from the Bible. We got it from nature and the study of science pointing to an intelligent designer. Are these men stupid? Are these men ignorant? Are these men insane or evil? And then maybe... My friend Dawkins forgot about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. In 1927, the German scientist Heisenberg discovered that you can't measure both the, the position and the velocity of a subatomic particle. If you measure its position, then you can't know its velocity precisely. If you measure its velocity, you can't know exactly where it is. And therefore, he said, the measuring or observing of a subatomic particle not only determines where it's going to go, but collapses it into existence. The particle doesn't exist until someone observes it. And it's forcing scientists to rethink some things. Dr. Paul Davis wrote in his book, The New Physics, in the chapter called The Quantum Factor, you can always claim that everything you perceive is real is there because there exists a larger system which collapses what you see into reality by measuring or observing it. Now, this isn't science fiction. This is science. Quantum mechanics. 
He said, in recent years, physicists have been interested in the quantum theory of the entire universe. By definition, there can be nothing outside of the universe to collapse the whole cosmic panorama into existence except God, perhaps? Could have told him that a long time ago. Who is the observer? If there has to be an observer, who is he? You see, physicists conclude there have to be an observer to measure, but who is it? They don't want to talk about that. But we're not afraid to. We're not afraid to face the facts. I don't claim to be able to prove to you that the Bible account of creation is true. I can't prove it. Nobody was there when it happened, except God. If you want to believe in the Bible account of creation, you're going to have to believe it by faith. Faith in God. Faith in His Word. No, I believe the evidence points that way. I believe that. But you can't prove it. I don't claim to be able to stand here and prove to you that the theory of evolution is false because that can't be done either. But I do want to show you that if you want to believe in evolution, you're going to have to believe it by faith. Evolutionists start Charles Darwin himself started with the presupposition, the basic fundamental principle that life as we know it today through the process of evolution happened without any supernatural input whatsoever. Now how does he know that? He didn't know that. He took that position by faith. Faith in chance. Faith in miracles. Instead of faith in the loving, all-knowing Creator God. God warns us about things like the theory of evolution. 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, Be on your guard, Timothy, with what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called science which some have professed and in so doing have wandered from the faith. Watch out for what is falsely called knowledge or science. And I want to tell you tonight that evolution is falsely called science. And that's precisely what he's talking about to Timothy. Watch out for those kinds of thoughts, those kinds of philosophies, those kinds of ideas. Now we find the answer to the question, what does a, a person believe if the discoveries of modern science contradict the Word of God? The answer is, it's not science. If it contradicts the Word of God, it's not science. Everything was created by God. We know that. We believe that by faith. By faith, the evolutionist says, no, it all happened without God. But he doesn't know that. It's not science. It's a philosophy. They put us down for bringing faith into the classroom when they're doing the very same thing on the opposite end of the scale. I'm not putting down science, folks. I believe in science. I believe in the scientific method. I got my degree in chemistry and I did graduate work in organic chemistry so I understand science. I understand the scientific method. What I'm telling you is evolution is not science. It's a philosophy. Now you may see a, a pile of bone fossils and you may study them and scientifically analyze them and come to the conclusion that those are dinosaur bones, but you cannot scientifically apply the scientific method and come to the conclusion that that dinosaur came from a flying monster bird. You can't know how they got there. That's faith. Faith in chance and miracles. By far, the largest body of evidence that scientists point to in support of 
theory of evolution is the geological column, and that's not really that hard to understand. You've all seen pictures of the earth sliced in half, and it looks like an onion, all the different layers. And those layers are different periods, different eons of time. And the further you go down into the earth, the older those layers are, and they show us that the deeper you go, the simpler the fossils are. And as you move out to the top, the fossils get more and more complex until on the surface there are all the complex life forms right there, including the monkeys and men. Now the problem is there's no place on earth that exists exactly the way they show it in the science books. In fact, there are millions and millions of acres where just the opposite is the case, and there are more complex life forms in the deeper layers and more simpler life forms on the outer layers. An impossible dilemma for an evolutionist who says there could not be any complex life forms in the deeper layers. An impossible dilemma. And then what about the Cambrian explosion? In 1984, in Yunnan, China, they discovered the most extensive and well-preserved Cambrian layer that confirmed what even Charles Darwin himself had seen, that the Cambrian layer contains virtually all of the different phyla of life that exists today already in the Cambri Cambrian layer with no transitory, no fossils leading up to it, simpler fossils, they just were there, they just appeared. Where did they come from? One scientist said, well, they, they must have obviously evolved somewhere else. But scientists have been looking and looking and looking for over 150 years, and they're always saying, well, it must have been somewhere else. Evolution can't always be happening somewhere else. But no one has ever seen a transition of the different kinds of life that God created. The Cambrian layer was a real problem for Charles Darwin. He knew about it. And Charles Darwin said, if this pattern holds, it's a genuine argument against my theory. Interesting, the pattern still holds. All of the basic phylum structures, almost all, existed in the Cambrian layer with all the body plans and parts. A body plan is similar to a car. All cars have the same basic body plan. They have wheels, they have an engine, they have a steering wheel, they have a fuel tank and an exhaust system. My car has the same body plan as a Rolls Royce, <laughs> even though it's not a Rolls Royce simple little Toyota. But that's the way life is. The different animals all have the same basic body plan. And those body plans were already present in the Cambrian layer. The, the Cambrian trilobite is just as complex as a modern crab. It was already there. You see, Darwin's theory is that life began with one cell and it began to multiply and divide and get more and more complex. He called it the tree of life and out of the outer branches are the more complex forms of life. It's a bottom-up expansion of life. But the fossil said something else. The fossil said, no, it's top-down, not bottom-up, because the phyla already existed suddenly without any gradual leading up to it. It was pre-planned by an intelligent designer. Dawkins agreed with Darwin. He said, without gradualness, we're back to a miracle. <laughs> Welcome, Dawkins. I wish he would just believe. And then there are more problems. There are more. <laughs> DNA. See, DNA is a double helix that actually determine it consists of amino acids arranged in a double helix that actually determine the production of protein no protein can be made without DNA but DNA is a protein where did it come from <laughs> and furthermore DNA can form the protein but it can't organize the protein into body plans and major parts in a cell, in, in an egg, the cells begin to multiply 
and as they accumulate, they migrate out towards the outer membrane. They line up around the outer membrane of the cell wall. And then, without any kind of information from the DNA, they suddenly begin to migrate to the different parts of the body that they're going to become. A foot, a hand, an eye, a heart, a brain. It's like a band scattered all over a football field with a trumpet here and a trombone there and a drum here and a violin here and a flute there and all of a sudden the drum master gives the signal and they all come in to line in a perfect formation. There are the cells. They're out there. The signal is given and they all go to right where they're supposed to be and that information is not stored in the DNA alone. No one knows where that information comes from. It has to come from God. God's never embarrassed by the evidence like evolutionists are. In Job, the 12th chapter, the little book of Job, in chapter 12, look at it with me. Verse 7, ask the animals and they'll teach you. Or the birds of the air and they'll tell you. Or speak to the earth and it'll teach you. Or let the fish of the sea inform you. Which of all these things does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? <laughs> study the animals. Study the fossils. Study the fish, the birds. Study nature. And see if it doesn't point to an intelligent creator God. Dr. Werner von Braun, father of the American Space Program, said, the more we explore the far recesses of space, the more convinced we become of a creator God. God isn't embarrassed by the evidence. The Bible flood explains the geological column different layers with different sediment rates. Any exceptions to that? Complex life form in a deeper layer, simple life form in an outer That's easy for us to understand. But it is an impossible dilemma for someone saying that there was no complex life form during the time of those deeper layers. God's never embarrassed by the evidence. Now, I'm not trying to say that there is no kind of evolution at all. I believe in microevolution, for example, variation among the species, adaptation. That's happening. We see it. Can't deny that. Somebody asked me, what about the salamander ring in California, the different kind of salamanders? So yeah, they're different. They change, but they're still salamanders. We don't see them becoming monkeys or something else. They're still salamanders. Each produces after its own kind. There is variation. I don't believe, and, and maybe I'll get in trouble for this, but this is what I think. I don't believe that God made St. Bernard's and Chihuahuas and Poodles. I think he made a dog. And through the process of mutation and variation, we got all the different kinds of dogs. But they're still dogs. They're not cats. They're still dogs. Each produces after its own kind, just the way the Bible said it would be. And there's another thing about mutations and change. A mutation always subtracts information from the gene pool. It never adds information. It subtracts. In order to become a more complex life form, it would have to add information, and no one has ever seen that happen. Study the earth, study the animals, and see if this isn't the work of an intelligent creator. And by the way, if you believe in evolution that life began with one single cell that got more and more complex until we have man living today, where did that cell come from? Now, they don't want to talk about that. They'll say, that's origins, not evolution. Well, if you're going to believe in evolution, there has to be an origin. You can't separate the two. Where did it come from? You say, well, both the lightning struck a pool of slime and it became a cell. Well, where'd the lightning come from? Where'd the pool of slime come from? 
It's not an explanation. If you say, well, God made it, and then he guided the evolutionary process. Well, if you believe God made the first cell, why don't you believe everything else God says about creation? In six days, he finished his work. A seventh day, he rested. <laughs> Evolution is a faith. Faith in chance. Faith in miracles. And we can't compromise it with true faith in the Word of God. Dr. Charles Singer confessed his faith when he said, Evolution is perhaps unique among major scientific theories and that the appeal for its acceptance is not that there is any evidence for it, but that any other proposed interpretation of the data is just too impossible to believe. Amazing, isn't it? Why? Why? Why do they want to point to a pool of slime as the origin of life instead of the hand of a creator God? Why? What's the motivation behind it? Not all scientists believe that. Dr. John Moore, the University of, of uh, Michigan State University, after a debate spoke to my father-in-law and told him, you can face anyone on this earth with the fact that there is no experimental evidence whatsoever for evolution to have occurred. Evolution is a faith, a faith in chance, a faith in miracles, and it cannot be compromised with the one true faith for all Christians in Christ. Faith in the wonderful word from Genesis to Revelation. I agree with that scientist. What do you say? <laughs> well, what about Genesis 1 and science? I mean, it, Moses... How, what, Moses wasn't a scientist, they say. Maybe he didn't know what he was writing. He was just writing poetically to describe the process of evolution. It doesn't sound like it when you read it. And Jesus didn't believe that. Jesus said, if you don't believe Moses, you can't believe me. In John 5, 47, Jesus believed Moses. In fact... When they challenged him about marriage and divorce and remarriage, Jesus said, Haven't you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female and said a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and the two will become one flesh? Haven't you read that? Jesus quoted Moses as an authority to support his argument. I believe Moses. Did you know Jesus was the only human eye witness to creation? And he didn't think it was important to change one word that Moses wrote. So why should we? I trust Jesus. Well, maybe those days were just symbolic of long periods of time. And God was guiding the evolutionary process. Maybe that's what was really happening. Well, I'm going to show you that if we take that approach, as many Christians are trying to take, that you will virtually abolish the gospel of Jesus Christ. So don't go to sleep. I'm going to come back to that point in a moment. But I want to answer the other question that we asked first, and that is, why is it? Why do men desperately want to believe in a theory of evolution instead of life as a result of a creator God? What's the driving, motivating force? Peter tells us, if you look with me in 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter answers that question. In 2 Peter, the third chapter, verse 3. First of all, you must understand in the last days scoffers will come scoffing following their own evil desires and they'll say, where is this coming that he has promised? Now watch, ever since our fathers died, everything goes on since it has at the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget 
that long ago by God's word the heavens existed, the earth was formed out of water and by water, and by these waters also the world at that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of godly men. You see, if you choose to believe in the Bible account of creation, then you have to believe God made us, that he knows more about us than anyone else, including ourselves, that he put within us certain laws. He drew those laws around us as a circle, and he said, if you want to be peaceful and have joy and happiness in your life, live according to these laws. These are the principles that I made for you. They define what it means to love. But if you break them and step out of bounds, then you're going to hurt and other people are going to hurt and this whole thing is going to collapse. If you believe in a creator, then you've got to believe in the obligation to believe and obey that creator. And so those who choose not to obey a creator would rather point to a pool of slime as the origin for their life than a loving God to whom they're created to. But to me, it makes a lot more sense to believe in a creator. If I were walking down the beach one day and I see something there that looks like a washed-out footprint, I could say, Ma, I think there was a human here. But I may not know that. And I walk along a little further and I see a bunch of rocks strung out along the beach. And I say, look at those rocks. They kind of organized. Maybe there was a human here. And I go a little further, and I see those rocks lined up in a pile, all stacked up, a bunch of rocks. And, hmm, somebody had to do that. The waves couldn't, could they? Maybe. But I walk a little further, and I see a bunch of rocks all aligned in a way that says, Jack Cologne, I love you. Now, if I were to say to you, that the waves did that. You would think, man, he is either stupid, or ignorant, or insane, or he's trying to avoid something. Because if I believe there's someone out there that loves me, then I need to know who that one is. Amen? It makes more sense. Look at us. Look at life. Look at the miracles all around us. It just makes so much more sense to believe that we are the result of a creator God. I want to shift our attention now, this last part of what I want to say, the results of believing in evolution. What happens when people shift away from the creator to the creature? You're going to be surprised about this. Romans, it's kind of lengthy, but bear with me. Romans chapter 1 in Romans chapter 1, since the creation of the world, verse 20, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. Study nature, you'll understand the Creator God. Verse 24, since they rejected that, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and they worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator. That's what Revelation is all about. Those who worship the beast worship created things rather than the Creator of the heavens and the earth. So what's the result of this creature worship? Here it is, verse 26. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. As a result of rejecting the Creator God, men abandon natural relations. Notice the link, men and women. But they abandoned that. And they were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. The theory of evolution, forgetting the Creator, results 
in the different kinds of things that we see happening all around us. If you don't believe that God made the man and the woman, and the man is to leave his parents, cleave unto his woman, then what's wrong with evolution? It's just another choice, an alternate lifestyle. But God didn't make us that way. And before you get too loud with the amens, I want to make it clear, what I just read is not popular. And the time is coming when I'll probably be considered criminal for reading what I read to you a few moments ago. They're already considering it in Canada. And I know that the only hope they really have is the same hope that you and I have, and that's to cling to the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's why I don't like loud amens when we get to this part, folks, because they're no more sinful than you and I. In fact, listen to this. Paul has a list. Furthermore, since they didn't think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They've become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossipers. I don't hear any amens now. <laughs> they are gossipers, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventing ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They're senseless. They're fruitless. They're faithless. They're heartless. Murderers. Gossipers right in there next to murderers. You see, all I'm trying to say is that when we reject the Creator God and turn to a theory of evolution, then things change in us and in the world and there's a blurred distinction between right and wrong anymore. Who can say to a homosexual that what they're doing is wrong when they're gossiping about homosexuals to everybody else in the church? No wonder they resent and resist coming to church. Maybe we need to change our attitudes a little bit. God doesn't like the sin, but he loves the sinner. If he didn't like the sinner, we'd all be in trouble. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Evolution not only changes what's taught in the science classroom, but it changes our whole perspective on life and the world. Richard Overman discovered in his research paper compar comparing origins of belief and moral views. In his surveys, he discovered the more the subject believes in creation, the less he or she is willing to morally accept sexual relationships between two unmarried consenting people. In other words, those who believe in creation are not nearly as likely to get involved in sexual relationships outside of marriage than those who do not believe in creation. Now that's an interesting correlation because evolution becomes not only a science but a world view. For years and years, scientists believed that God created the universe with laws to function by laws and he created the humans to function according to laws. It was the job of science to discover what those laws were. Herbert Spencer in the late 1800s wrote, the poverty of the incapable, the starving of the idle, the pushing aside of the weak by the strong are all decrees of a large far-seeing benevolence or love. Funny way to describe love trampling the weak into the dust? And that kind of thinking gave Marquis de Sade the, the inspiration to say, as nature has made us men the stronger we can do with her women as we please. How many women want to be evolutionists now? And in the early 1900s, a very powerful world leader emerged who embraced the theory of evolution and survival of the fittest. He said, the law of nature must take its course in the survival of the fittest. The Christian notion of charity should be replaced by the ethic of strength over weakness. Adolf Hitler 
result the gas chambers as he tried to exterminate the Wicca races and eliminate them. Darwin gave credence like no one ever before. He gave credence to the basis form of racism. Charles Darwin himself wrote in the, on the descent of man a quote you don't see in the science books today. At some future period, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. And he lined them up according to the color of their skin. That's what evolution is all about. No one believes that, do they? Well, ask Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who believes that the Jewish race should be extinguished and wiped out today. In fact, Professor Robert Simon said this in Reader's Digest, in 30 years of college teaching, he said, I've never met a student who denied that the Holocaust happened, but what I see increasingly is worse. Students who acknowledge the fact of the Holocaust, but they can't bring themselves to say that killing millions of people is wrong. Oh, yeah, it happened, but who am I to say that it's wrong? Of course, I dislike the Nazis, one said, but who is to say that they are morally wrong? How can he if he believes in evolution? Because there is no absolute standard of right and wrong. It's strength over weakness, survival of the fittest. That's where we are today. I was watching an interview on the O'Reilly Factor just after Littleton, Colorado. You remember that story. And they were talking to one of the parents, Brian Rohrberg, of a child who was killed. And the parents had the opportunity to witness a video that Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold had prepared before the incident. It's unreleased and others can't see it, but this man was on television telling us what he saw. And here is what they said. Eric Harris, Dylan Klebold said, and the reason we're doing this is because of evolution. It's time to kill off the weak and evolution gives us the right, even the obligation to do it. Interesting, isn't it? Now, no evolutionist would ever teach that. Charles Darwin never would. But the point is, who can argue against it unless you're stronger than they are? Evolution is Satan's ultimate weapon against the people of God. Remember the two points of attack? The commandments of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you believe in the theory of evolution, you're going to eventually do away with the commandments of God. Because strength will rule over weakness, and there's no absolute standard anymore. The two can't go together. A lot of people don't know this, but the theory of evolution was not invented by Charles Darwin. First indication that we have of it was the venerated Catholic scholar St. Augustine of Hippo in the fourth century when he wrote that God should have made use of natural evolutionary original causes in the production of man's body is not improbable. Darwin just made it popular. John Paul II confirmed the theory of evolution saying the gist of the theory of evolution as a scientific hypothesis is in perfect agreement with the Christian conception of the universe. For Scripture does not tell us in what form the present species of plants or animals were originally created by God. He would do away with the commandments of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I want to show you that the theory of evolution subtly takes away the cross of Jesus Christ. Romans, the fifth chapter, Therefore, verse 12, just as sin entered the world through one man and death came through sin, in this way death came to all men. 
How did death come into the world? Through sin. Death is the result of sin. But if you accept the geological column as explained by the evolutionists, you have millions and millions and millions of years of life living and dying and becoming extinct and living and dying and becoming extinct of fighting and struggling to survive, of dying and dying and dying and dying until finally man evolves. So if you believe in evolution, then death cannot be the result of sin. But the Bible says that it is. Death came into the world through sin. But if death had been happening through the ages, through the centuries, through the process of evolution, then death cannot be the result of sin because sin didn't happen until Adam and Eve ate the apple. Furthermore, if death is not the result of sin, then Jesus Christ could not have paid the price for your sin when he died on the cross. And evolution subtly but thoroughly pulls the rug out from underneath the gospel of Jesus Christ. Two points of attack, the commandments of God and the cross of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1, Verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And who was the Word? Verse 14, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word was Jesus Christ. He was present with God. He was God. He made us in the beginning. All things were made by Him, the Word, and nothing was made without Him. Who was the God who said, let there be light, and there was light? It was the Son of God who would later become Jesus Christ. Who was the God who said, let there be birds, let there be animals? Who was the God who knelt down and breathed into that body the breath of life and watched it become a living being? It was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who would one day become a man and die on the cross. Worship the creator of the heavens and the earth.